What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another interview edition of Learn Crypto. My name is Nick Hellman, and today I have back with us again the co-founder of Horizon, Rob Viglione. How are you doing today, Rob? Nick, doing well. Thank you for having me again. It's always a pleasure. Good to see you. I think you said you're over in Milan right now, kind of, kind of wrapping up the uh, arrangement of a research and development team over there. I am, yeah. So I've been here for the last three months, and the whole point was to come here and just personally manage the, the setting up of an office. So we have our first official office for the company or for the project, uh, rather than just everyone working from different places around the world, uh, which is a big step forward. You know, for the, for the industry as a whole, there really aren't that many projects that have dedicated offices and you know, actual uh, teams working together on a day-to-day -day basis. So for us, it's a really big deal. And the office here is, is R&D focused entirely. So it's a, it's a crack engineering team that uh, is centered around our, uh, you know, Alberto Garofolo. We have Maurizio here uh, in really the full cast of Italian characters that you see on our, our website or here in Milan. So it was really good to come here and, and you know, be part of this uh, office setup. That's awesome. And guys, we're just going to kind of go over a few things that uh, Zen has been going on uh, recently with the bear market, new projects, etc. But if you want more information on Zen, I'll have some links in the description or go to our YouTube homepage to the interview section. And I have quite a few uh, interviews with Rob. Some of, some of them not so good with the 51% attack. Others really good talking an overview about the Zen ecosystem all the way back to when you guys were Zen Cash versus Horizon. You know, what really caught my eye, even when you were Zen Cash, is that you guys weren't just another privacy coin, but striving to create a privacy ecosystem. I know you guys have a new product coming out called Sphere. Can you explain what this is and how it helps move the Horizon ecosystem forward? Absolutely. So we have a couple of privacy-oriented products uh, coming out. So uh, Sphere is the biggest one, and actually we're officially releasing it on Monday, so tomorrow. So it's, it's been a long journey for us, uh, a lot of iteration uh, on the back end. Um, so it's been, it's been uh, quite a ride and we're really excited to finally launch tomorrow. So really it, it's starting out and the reason we're not even really calling it a wallet is because the ambition for Sphere is much bigger. But of course the core capability is an upgraded wallet. Uh, so upgraded wallet really uh, on the technical side on the back end code. So having very robust, uh, you know, professionally developed back end code for the, the wallet and then on the front end, a much more usable, uh, you know, consumer-friendly GUI. Uh, so for us, this is a really big deal. Uh, it has an upgraded messaging interface. So the Zen messaging protocol that we developed um, about over a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, was running previously on a standalone app called Zen Chat, and then also within the Swing wallet uh, through a, you know, just a, a different tab on Swing that had the messenger. Now we've upgraded the UI, so it's, it, look, it looks and feels a lot more like an actual messaging service. Um, and like I said back then, and I'll say it again, it's not gonna replace WhatsApp anytime soon. Um, but it is, you know, if you are extremely privacy focused on your communications, uh, Sphere is probably the app for you on the messaging side. So initially it's, you know, a, an upgraded enhanced wallet, uh, which is both full, like full node. So it's a full node and a light client. Um, which is nice. You can toggle between the two of them. Um, it's designed so that you can import your private keys from, say, Ledger um, and from other mobile wallets out there. And right now we have concurrent um, you know, uh, development where we're going to be um, uh, releasing uh, an iOS and an Android version of it in the near future. So this was really just the first, you know, get it out there to the public and get people to start using it in its beta version. Uh, it's a nice, uh, you know, from a consumer-friendly perspective, a really nice upgrade. Uh, and then we're going to have some sprints to make uh, much more enhanced functionality there for advanced users, things like a console, so you could do your command line scripting, um, and then getting into like uh, node management. So right now, a lot of uh, node uh, operators in our community use the Arisen wallet, uh, which is still great, but we're also going to uh, bring that capability into Sphere. But the longer term vision for Sphere is to really be a single access point into our, our ecosystem and to integrate things like a DVPN into it. So that was the other product that we announced in the last monthly update is we have a decentralized VPN service that we're gonna be unrolling into our ecosystem in the next few months. So we've already, you know, the, the VPN product itself is done and now we're working on the integration into the Zen D, our core uh, protocol. Uh, so that's, that's really exciting. So, and then going beyond that, so having kind of an integrated uh, VPN into it at you know, the longer term perspective would be well, we could potentially do a decentralized email service, do decentralized, um, you know, uh, web browser, and do different things like that. Where really it's an information portal, 
that is a first point of entry into our ecosystem. That's awesome. You know, that you kind of touched on what I was going to follow up with that in, um, you know, a lot of people use the Ryzen wallet, like you said, for yeah. super nodes or secure nodes. Some people also use the ledger. Um, it works, but if you guys are running multiple nodes, I'd be careful with that because sometimes it gets boggled right. up right there. But if you have you one secure not. node and you have the ledger and you're comfortable, yeah. I've had no problems with that. Um, yeah. So it does seem like nodes will be able to be hosted or at least you ran off of the Sphere wallet in the near term future, but not quite off of the beta version. Correct. Correct. So off the beta version, I wouldn't do that. Um, it, it's, it's a deterministic wallet. So it's really designed for user friendliness okay. uh, as well. But we will have a bulk import uh, feature where you can migrate over, you know, all of your, your secure nodes and super nodes at once, and then manage them. But I would wait for the next release to really do that. Yeah, it sounds like in a few months yeah. that Sphere is really going to be the one stop shop for this Horizon ecosystem you guys are striving to build. And, Absolutely. Uh, I think that's exciting. You know, I think a lot of the projects and that you guys have already put out and the products you're looking to put out are interesting, but when they're all separated in different applications, it's hard to really get that user base on board. If you can exactly. have the central hub and sphere, I think that can really help the ecosystem grow, get utilization of your network. And I know you probably don't care about price appreciation, but usually that utilization <laughs> of the network drives price appreciation for the Zen coin. Uh, that yeah. is the native currency of Horizon's blockchain. Yep. So you guys have been working on side chains for a while now. How is that progress coming and what benefits does this bring to Horizon, to node runners, to Zen users? Mm -hmm. Like what are people going to see or what are the benefits of these side chains you guys have been talking so much about? So the way that I see it, side chains are the big innovation that we're working on. Um, so it, it's really going to be the big pivot point to be uh, a real legitimate platform ecosystem. So the way we have it right now is we have a standard blockchain that was derived from a, a cryptocurrency, and we're doing all sorts of stuff there. We built out a big network. Now we're doing a DVPN on it. We have the, the Sphere app. But really, the, the big breakthrough is going to be with a, a fully decentralized sidechain system. So our sidechain system is, we think, the, the first truly decentralized one in, in the fact that you don't need to know who your certifying nodes are. Uh, so a lot of the other sidechain protocols out there have certain, like trusted certifying nodes that, you know, everything runs through them. So ours is a fully decentralized one where really we define uh, the forward and backward transfer protocol for when you want to move funds you know, between the main chain and side chain. And it's unbounded. You can have an, any number of side chains. Of course, you know, I, I wouldn't be so bold as to say we can support an infinite number of side chains just yet, but we want to support many side chains. Um, and you know, of course, to support a very large number of many side chains, we probably need to work with work about upgrading our core protocol, but in the near future, so we're gonna be releasing an SDK, so a software developer kit, uh, which will be a set of APIs so that other developers now for the first time will be able to really plug and play into the Horizon blockchain. Uh, and this is the big thing, because for us, uh, we've been one, uh, one, one core team on the, the Zen Blockchain Foundation building on this ecosystem. Now we wanna open it up for everyone. So it's been a long road to get to the point where we can open it up. Um, the sidechain SDK design is done. We're in the middle of coding it right now. Uh, and the, the plan for release was supposed to be at the end of this, this month or next month. So really December, January was always the time frame. We've actually had to divert some resources really because we wanted to do um, to accelerate some of our sapling upgrades, which I think are extremely important for this ecosystem to be a, a zero knowledge snark based protocol. Uh, I think we have to keep pace with sapling. So we have uh, another core upgrade going live in middle of January. So we diverted some of our core engineering resources to make sure that this went very smoothly. Uh, everything's looking good. All of the tests are passing. So we're looking to release that code uh, to the market next week or the week after. Um, just to make sure everything's good, lock it in, do kind of a, a code lock and release and then get everyone to upgrade. Um, so we're, we still have a, a, a small team working on that uh, on the sidechain. SDK, and then we're going to be migrating the rest of the team back into it and focusing on a, a major sprint to deliver that to market because it is a core capability for us. Uh, and over the next month, we're going to be announcing uh, some other kind of first uh, sidechain clients, which will be, I think, a really big deal for the ecosystem because now not only will we have a nice scalable infrastructure, but now we also have a first set of clients that want to build on it. So that's really important. Is the goal with the side chains to kind of lighten up some of the congestion on the main Horizon network, or is the goal for other developers to make more Zen products, or is the goal to be more of like a protocol platform and allow individuals to create dApps upon your 
upon your blockchain? Like which of the three or is it kind of all of the three? Or? So you just nailed all three of them actually. <laughs> so uh, it, it is all three. So we, we want uh, other developers and other organizations to be building in our ecosystem to be building things on top of it, but not just uh, dApps. So we also want entire blockchain protocols to be built and it done in a way where it, it's kind of like the way that I view it is we're building a, uh, a public infrastructure and uh, we could have like private uh, players plug into that public infrastructure in a very analogous way to say, the early days of networking. You had all these siloed intranets. And that's the way I view this industry right now is you have all these siloed intranets that are being built, like IBM, Hyperledger, and all these enterprise solutions are building their own intranets for companies, which is sort of ridiculous. It's like the old days of, of early networking. Uh, well, now we're building the, the, the vision of having all of these siloed intranets plugging into a public intranet. So Horizon itself would be the public intranet. Sidechains would be the vehicle through which they can plug into it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff you could do there. You know, in, and some of the most interesting things for me are thinking about like, one of the first sidechains that I personally want to see our, our company build is uh, a, a really supercharged tokenization platform. I think tokenization is probably where the next bull run is going to come from, but it's such an important aspect of what we're doing on so many levels, economically, financially, socially. Uh, then there's obviously dApps and there's a whole dApp environment the sidechains can enable. Um, there's the enterprise client model that we talked about. There's a lot of different things, even with experimental protocols. Say you have uh, an experimental, you know, modified proof of stake protocol you want to plug in and you want to you want to play with it, but you want to you don't want to build out your whole node architecture and convince people to run it. You can just incentivize our certifying nodes or really our super nodes, incentivize them to be certifying nodes and you know plug in your experimental protocol. See how that works. So there's so much that this thing opens up. It's a really exciting chapter for the project. That's awesome. Uh, I will get back to the nodes here in a second, but uh, cause it's kind of going to stem from my next question here. You know, the market conditions are tough here in the crypto ecosystem. We watched Bitcoin fall down to yeah. around $3,000. Zen now around four fifty or $5. Never thought it would get back down there. I'm sure you guys yeah. didn't either. So how yeah. is horizon maintaining and working through these conditions? Have you guys put anything in place to, I know you guys have the treasury reward, but uh, how are you maintaining all these teams under these conditions? Yeah. Okay. So this is extremely challenging. Imagine, you know, being, uh, trying to, uh, manage a company where you have no idea what your budget's going to be tomorrow, let alone like next year or two years from now. So it's been very tough at, at the beginning of the year and back in January, we, we built out our team based on how we thought we would have to accomplish our strategic objectives. And we were pretty happy with how things were going. And then the market collapsed on us. And, uh, basically, uh, up until the point where Bitcoin was about $6,500, we internalized our losses, uh, which is bad. I mean, we had private funding. Uh, for instance, I, I lent a bunch of money to the foundation and we had other, other people who really care about the project lending at zero cost um, to the foundation to keep things going and just suck up the losses. We hit a point though when Bitcoin just really uh, collapsed below 6500 where we just couldn't do that anymore. It didn't make sense. So we had to start scaling back hard on our team. And we're actually wrapping up the fourth round of cuts right now for the team, which is tough. And before we even got into that, we slashed obviously all, you know, all of our sponsorships and, you know, uh, it, that was challenging and painful in itself. We, we stopped doing events, stopped traveling, you know, all of the low hanging fruit of discretionary expenditure, we just had to stop like any org should in these kind of environments. But then we got into the team, we started slashing the team, four rounds of cuts. But then what we realized was the price kept collapsing. And every time we would baseline a budget and our team composition to support that budget, it, it would just, the floor would be swept, you know, pulled out from us again. Mm -hmm. so, so what we've done now is we, we have a, a multi-tiered approach. So in addition to all these cuts, we, we've done about 80 to 90% of our budget we've cut since the beginning of the year, which is online, like un tracked our price decline. We've also recently talked about increasing the treasury to 20% of block reward, whereas previously it was 10%. So this was, I thought it would be more controversial within the community, but actually it had much more uh, overwhelming majority sentiment in, in support of it because what we realized after the announcement was the number one concern for stakeholders was, will we survive? And they don't want to be uh, supporting mining or running nodes on a shell of a project that just can't sustain itself or operate anymore. Yeah. So this was, you know, the, the combination of deep cuts, uh, realignment of our strategic objectives to focusing on just the key things that we think are absolutely critical. And by critical, I mean, why do we even exist? What are our differentiating technologies? What makes us unique? You know, from the other thousand plus projects that are still in the market, 
and, and that's what we need to focus on. We need to keep moving forward on that. So we've done everything we think um, in a very methodical way that just makes sense. And the last resort was increased block reward. I can tell you we're, st we're not stopping there. So we're also looking at for some other um, you know, capital sources um, and looking at other partnerships and other ways of kind of building more of a coalition uh, ecosystem where it's not just the Zen Blockchain Foundation doing everything kind of independently, but having other organizations uh, come in and take on key roles and support, you know, bring dev teams, uh, bring talents, bring capital, and then even going to other capital markets for capital through different organizations. So really we're, we're, uh, we're not, you know, laying over and playing dead in this market. We're, we're fighting it completely. And actually I could say our, our organization now is much more efficient uh, robust. We have awesome project management processes now, contract management, cost management. Um, and it, sometimes it takes a kick in the butt to really, you know, lock down everything perfectly. But, you know, I'm really happy with where we are. And despite the low price, the project's still kicking butt. Yeah, that's good to see there that you guys are doing that. A lot of these projects you're starting to see are becoming insolvent or they just have no more announcements mm -hmm. because their devs are just kind of sitting on their hands like, well, this is what's yeah. available now. So you do what you want with that. So it's good yep. to see that you guys are kind of continually relooking at and restructuring the treasury system. Now, yeah. before your treasury was 10% of block rewards. Now it's 20% of block yeah. rewards. I've had a bunch of people reaching mm -hmm. out to me asking if they're going to get less secure node rewards, less super node rewards. Mm -hmm. Where is this t extra 10% coming from and who is it really going to affect? Yeah. So uh, just to give peace of mind, it, it is, it is coming from the mining pool. So the mining pool was 70% of block reward. Now it's going to be 60%. Be 20% to treasury and 10% to secure nodes and 10% to super nodes, as usual for those those uh, stakeholder groups. Now this represents a 14%-ish uh, decrease in Zen on Zen return for for miners. So I expect there to be sort of a commensurate drop in net hash. Our net hash has been pretty good, and we socialized this with some of our biggest strategic miners previously. And the way I look at the mining the mining world is you have strategic miners, which are really big supporters of the project and mine to actually accumulate Zen. And then you've got uh, economic miners that really just point their rigs, you know, based on, you know, dynamically based on ROI. So for the, the economic miners, um, they, they'll probably, I, we could probably expect a, about a 14% drop in net hash, give or take, maybe it overshoots 20% from that pool. But then you have the strategic miner pool where uh, they assured us that they're actually happy with this because this shows more stability for the project and actually instilled more confidence in the long term. So they'd rather mine, like their perspective was, they would rather mine, uh, you know, a, a project that has a future than mine one that's just dying and let it die because of the short term, you know, Zen on Zen return. So for them, it's more of a long term perspective and it was great to have their support. Now, the thing to note is uh, mining rewards dynamically adjust with NetHash. So uh, they probably, they're, they're for sure will be another market equilibrium at another price point at another net hash point. So there's a bunch of different parameters that define the market equilibrium. It's not going to be the end of the world. There were a lot of people or not a lot, but there were some people that were very concerned that, uh, you know, decreasing minor Zen on Zen ROI would induce a whole bunch of miners to just dump all of their Zen and stop mining and the network's going to crash and no one's going to mine anymore. Uh, this doomsday scenario is absolutely not going to happen. Um, so it, it just doesn't even make sense because really the group that would probably point their hash power away would be the economic miners, but they'll point it back right back again as soon as other net hash leaves and all of a sudden there's a greater Zen on Zen you know, ROI because the net hash has gone down. Um, so and these guys probably dump their Zen as soon as they mine it anyway. So there is a very complex ecosystem and it's not black and white. Now, of course, we need to realize miners are an extremely important stakeholder group. And we have to make sure that the future for mining Zen is still very profitable. But we think that's exactly what we're doing by supporting the project and making sure we're actually continuing development of our key differentiating technologies. Yeah, that's, you know, at first, when I first read the headline, you know, Zen changing treasury, I was a little concerned. Uh, yeah. A lot of my friends and myself run secure notes, super notes, whatever. But after reading yeah. it, I think the best decision was to take it from uh, the miners. Uh, because like you said, some miners are going to leave the network and with difficulty adjustments, you're going to end up getting that equilibrium, which means your profitability or your Zen rewards in time, a week, two weeks, whatever it may be, is probably going to be about the same uh, just right. based on the psychology of the miners. So I think right. that, that that was the right decision. 
And I think that provides a lot more funds for you guys to continue growing your ecosystem. So I was happy to yeah. see that as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and just to put it in perspective, you know, doing a 20% treasury pool is really putting our, our treasury budget back to where it was about a month ago. So it's not like, it's not like we're getting a big windfall. I, there, there's going to be no huge reserve accumulation. There's no, you know, we're not going to double or triple our salaries, you know, because many of us actually have been not taking a salary because the project has been, you know, hurt so much financially. So we have a lot of volunteers uh, and we have a lot of people that took significant pay cuts. Uh, so this is really just to you know, keep us alive and operating in a point that's is healthy and stable, which I think is better for everyone. Now, if the hypothetically, if the market turns around or Zen gets, you know, what I think could be a proper valuation, mm -hmm. would you guys revert that treasury back to a more feasible amount down back to 10% or 15% or something like that? Yeah, so that's obviously always on the table. Uh, the, the perspective, so we talked about this quite significantly before uh, making this decision. And uh, the, the, the item on the table was, do we hard code in basically a stop or a reversion? Um, do we put some other, you know, maybe variable condition there? And, and the, answer, the answer we came up with was no, because one, we have no idea how severe or persistent this bear market's gonna be. So trying to guess the stuff on like a time phase basis doesn't make sense. On the financial basis, it's such a volatile market. We've had occasions where Zen's gone up to 60 bucks and we think everything's great. We're gonna, you know, we have so much more money here and so much more budget. And maybe we start hiring some people and then a month later, Zen's down to like $20. So if we were to make a decision like this a priori without actually having the full knowledge of what's going on in our full financial state, uh, I think it could really, um, you know, be a very bad decision. So the, the perspective that we had was, we're racing a part of the resources for, or a major part of the resources are going towards sidechains. And our most important sidechain, I would say, is our governance sidechain, which is our treasury voting system, our DAO. So I think this is the appropriate uh, time to reevaluate everything. I, I think the DAO is the perfect uh, you know, vehicle to say, well, what should our treasury be? Maybe 20% makes no sense. Maybe 10% is better. I don't know. I think it's much better to rather than have us unilaterally make decisions, which this was painful because we were saving even this for Dow decision, but now we hit an emergency mode where, mm -hmm. okay, we, we're not going to just watch the project, you know, collapse. So we have to step in and make a decision, but if we're going to make another decision up or down or even staying, you know, where it is now, I think the, the Dow voting system is better. And we were even going to put this to vote now, but you know, we, we talked about some voting systems. My favorite is a quadratic voting system. But, and we talked about different ways of saying, well, how, how can we actually measure a unique voter and making sure we have a balance between, you know, one vote, one person versus someone might be a major stakeholder, but we don't want the major stakeholders to just run away with the election and just dominate everything. So quadratic voting is the most elegant compromise, I think, in, from game theory, which I would have loved to do. But all of the systems right now are gameable. So to put such a, an, a, a critical decision to a vote that's easily gameable just didn't make sense. So we figured, okay, this is, this is an environment where we have to make a decision. But if we're going to reverse this or change it in any way, uh, hopefully we can hold out for the treasury down, not have to make another emergency decision before then. That's awesome. That's what I kind of figured because it kind of just caught me off guard how quick you guys made that choice. But uh, hearing yeah. that kind of makes sense. And, you know, like you said, if it was gameable, if somebody has a ton of, say you did it based on nodes, each node is a vote, then maybe they can game the system if they're a large stakeholder and maybe they make the wrong exactly. decision because uh, maybe they misunderstood the economics as well and they thought they were going to re receive less rewards or something like that. Exactly. So, exactly. You guys are always popping out a ton of integrations, but one that has just caught my eye is Binance Info. You know, what was the process to get added to that and what kind of information is really going to kind of be provided here? Um, obviously, we can go over tons of integrations. You guys are like on every exchange now. But this one caught my eye because Binance, even in this downtime, is really the main source of liquidity uh, for the yeah. crypto ecosystem. I think is going to be, you know, with Coinbase, going to be probably one of the top two uh, liquidity pools moving forward in this ecosystem yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, shout out, big shout out to Rowan, who's constantly rocking it on all of the integrations. Uh, so he's done a ridiculous job. And the fact that we're on about three dozen exchanges is really him because of him. Uh, and his just relentless work ethic to constantly get out there and get, get more integrations. Now, Binance Info actually stemmed from Binance Gold, which was uh, a certifying program, really. So Binance decided there's so many different projects out there. It's hard for investors or just enthusiasts to really understand what's what, uh, and which projects are, say, more serious than other projects. So we were uh, you know, brought into their Binance Gold program, which is really nice because it basically said, 
we're a high quality team that's doing really good differentiating work. We're not just a shell of a project um, or just, you know, something that might be lower quality. So from our perspective, that was just great that they brought us into their gold program. And from gold, they went into the info program, which is going to be great for just giving a lot more information to investors. Um, so they, they have direct insight into say what's going on with our project because not everyone is going to be like you, Nick, where they, they follow our live streams and read our blogs or whatnot. A lot of investors just see a ticker symbol and that's it. But to have the information linked directly, you know, coming from our team into Binance, I think is excellent. It's kind of like, uh, like block, what Blockfolio does, which is mm. awesome. Uh, I think Blockfolio, the team there just does an awesome job. Um, they, they actually have uh, an info pipe from our team so that important announcements actually go to anyone who decides to voluntarily track the project. Yeah, that's uh, called from within their platform. Blockfolio signal, guys. It's in beta. So yeah. if you use Blockfolio, even if you don't, I don't really yeah. use Blockfolio to store all my, you know, how many coins I have for each mm. individual project, but I use it for no, uh, news. Now this Blockfolio signal, there's only about 10 or 15 projects on Blockfolio signal. You can get mm. instant notifications that pop up on your phone for these projects. Uh, and it's an easy way to stay up to date. Like you said, I do this as almost like a secondary job as far as doing YouTube and research on these projects and yeah. trying to find utilization. But a lot of people have busy lives and they're interested in blockchain, but don't have as much time. I yeah. think Blockfolio Signal is a good source. I think Binance Info may turn into a good source. And uh, it's kind of exciting to see that Zen is already on those. And I think the other projects that are on there as well kind of showed legitimacy and that's how they got mm -hmm. added to both of these yeah. platforms. So definitely check that out, guys. So, you know, we kind of talked about Zen. Like I said, guys, if you want more information on Zen, go to the interview section, find my other two or three interviews with uh, Rob Viglione, the co-founder of Zen, and some other people from the Zen uh, family and team over there. So let's just talk about the crypto ecosystem as a whole for a second. Are you still a firm believer in the space and the technology even during this bear market? Do you think this is just another market cycle for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? Do you think we're going to get back going? The, the, the market sentiment is going to turn a little better and the utilization is going to increase? I think I know your answer, but uh, let's hear from you. <laughs> Absolutely, I am, for sure. So uh, I would say I'm more bullish on the tech today than I was a year ago when prices were just going crazy. Um, so and even just to put things in perspective, the market is, is, is a horrible year for sure from the all-time highs, but we're still significantly higher than we were, you know, even a year and a half ago. So uh, it, it's really, the sky isn't falling. And I think this revolution that we're on right now is, is real. It's huge. It's, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, so I'm, I'm very bullish on this stuff. I think what was going on last year was just a hint of some of the potential. And there was a huge uh, kind of euphoria that followed that, where a lot of people were just for the first time getting involved and just in a way, really didn't know how to digest what was going on and we're placing valuations on projects that made no sense. Like you should not write a white paper, have never run a business in your life and attract tens of millions of dollars in capital. Like that, that scenario should never happen. What's happening now is a lot of the weaker projects are leaving the market or they're dormant. They're, they're really no longer in existence. Uh, and a lot of the capital is fled. And right now though, it's going to projects that actually have mature teams. Um, products on the market and big visions to disrupt real industries. So the next wave that's coming from this, I have no idea where prices are going, but it, it is going to be disruptive and we're actually creating real services that people are going to want. And one example is our DVPN. So what this is, and a lot of people don't realize is we're, you know, in about three months, we're going to be running the largest exit point VPN service in the world. So we have like 25,000 nodes right now. And we're, we're going to offer this DVPN as an option for our node operators to use or to run on their servers uh, and get paid to do it. So node operators will have another revenue stream, which is great for node operators. For, for consumers, it's awesome because now you have a, a truly anonymous decentralized VPN that you know for sure isn't collecting any data and you don't even have to register an email address to use. Just register a Zen address. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's it's breakthrough, it will have 10 times more exit nodes than the, the largest competitor on the market today. But this is an example of creating a real service that people who, who care nothing or know nothing about blockchain could use because it's a better service, at least from you know, certain dimensions, what they're looking for, like exit nodes and, and not, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> anonymous usage. Uh, so that's, that's the, next, the next wave here is creating real things that people care about and not trying to convince them 
hey, you should care about ending the Fed, you should, which I think you should, uh, <laughs> or care about, you know, uh, you know, saving the world through blockchain. You shouldn't even have to know what asymmetric cryptography is to use these products. Yeah. Uh, you know, so this is the future, and this is where we're going. So for sure, I'm very bullish on the tech. What we're doing here is is definitely going to be game changing in so many different ways. Yeah, I'm with you there. I think the tech is going nowhere, and I think an example of that we'll just use your new Sphere product as a, as an example. The GUI needs to get better for some of these projects and products. Exactly. That way users don't even know what they're paying for or that it's running on the blockchain, but they just understand that it works better and it's more effective. Yep. Also, as far as price standpoint, I think that, like you said, that was kind of a retail blow off top. The price got ahead of the fundamentals. Um, and I think a lot of this FUD and bear market sentiment has been driven by the institutions which have put so mm -hmm. much time, effort, and money into building um, their, their infrastructure, whether it's uh, TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, Eris X, Back Exchange, Goldman Sachs, the list goes on and on. These are big institutional players in the traditional markets with a large amount of assets under management. And I think uh, they wouldn't be spending all this time, research and development and money if they weren't going to kind of, if they didn't see a positive future in both price and utilization for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And I really think that, uh, that we're just getting started here in this ecosystem. It's still very immature and that's why you get volatility. Same thing with the tech bubble but I think the strong projects and platforms will survive just like the Amazons, the Googles and the Apples have survived of this era. I think we're going to see that in this ecosystem as well. Uh, so whether you're an early investor or an early user or an early supporter of these networks, I think uh, give it one year, two year, three years, I think you're going to be really happy with that decision and uh, getting involved in this crypto and blockchain market. I totally agree, Nick. That was very well stated. <laughs> <laughs> That's really about all I have. If you have anything that you wanted to add about Zen or about the crypto ecosystem, uh, do it now or forever hold your peace. Otherwise, we'll kind of, <laughs> okay. we'll kind of wrap this up. Uh, I'll throw some links in the description where people can get to your website, maybe your personal Twitter account, and maybe can learn a little more about this privacy ecosystem you at Horizon are trying to create. Absolutely. So the big, the big news, guys, tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern, you'll be able to download Sphere. So check it out. Uh, please do so. Give it a shot and let us know what you think. There we go. Perfect timing for this, uh, yeah, for this interview. Exactly. I didn't even know that was coming, but that works out. Uh, so until yeah. next time, guys, stay tuned for your daily updates on cryptocurrencies right here at Learn Crypto. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Nick.